Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. This episode from the meeting room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org. Porch Light Rental and Destination Services. Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs. Visit them at porchlightrental.com. Cube Monk, featuring the world's first smart cube. Track your goods with our advanced GPS system. Welcome to the future of moving and relocation at cubemonk.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Insured Nomads provides protection and peace of mind with health insurance, travel insurance, group, or tailored insurance for the globally mobile. Visit us at insurednomads.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. This is Ed Cohen in San Diego, and we have a global teleconference today with a special guest from around the world. And I'm really happy to welcome everybody to Global TV Talk Show. This is a news product of globalbusinessnews.net. So let's begin the conversations. Uh, let's say hello to Sandra Corona, who comes to us today from Eastern Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Sandra. Here, hi, my name is Sandra Corona, and I am a senior global mobility advisor. I'm a freelancer here in Saudi Arabia, and I am currently the creator and runner of Gomo X, which is a global mobility book club for um, people all around the world. We currently have 109 members. That's pretty. That's a pretty good number for a, a book club. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. And hello, everybody that I know and who doesn't. Well, nice to meet yeah. you, too. Thank you, Sarona. Thank you very much, Sandra Corona and Saudi. We're going to get back to you in just a moment. I know you have some really interesting things to share. Uh, once again, everybody, you can use the chat and introduce yourselves. Uh, if you're not going to speak, please put yourself on mute. We're getting feedback on the system here. And we want to make sure everybody either has a really clear mic on or headset. Okay. It's really important to have uh, sound that does mm -hmm. not interfere with what each of us wants to say. Sarah Tabbitt, uh, congratulations on your, the launch of your new book. And uh, please quickly just say hi. We'll get right back to you. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here with you tonight. Tonight for me and morning for everyone, uh, as I assume. So, uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Ed. Uh, I'm happy to uh, talk about today my book. I'm an HR director um, with Schneider Electric, but also I'm an author of uh, Inclusion Starts With You, which was uh, published last uh, month, I would say, in the end of uh, December. Happy uh, to be here with you. Congratulations on the launch. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's, let's move quickly here. Stephen Howard is an author of more than 20 books and uh, Caliente Leadership based in the LA metro area, or are you in Mexico today? No, I'm still in Southern California. Ed, welcome to everybody. Nice to meet everybody. And as it says, I do uh, leadership development and I help other authors publish their books. And um, nice to talk to you about Agile Women Leaders today. Thank you. Yes. Now, today's program is specifically, and, and not only this program, but the program we just produced January 13, and the next edition will be March 1 and then April 1. We're continuing the series. We're elongating it. And for the most part, different people on each production, although others like you are welcome to join future productions as well. The whole idea is to extend this conversation and to make it into a resource for the world of talent management going forward. Free access, free download, nothing to buy, nothing to sign, okay? Mika Cross and I have known each other uh, several years. Um, she is a, a former 
uh, officer in the U.S. Army and uh, pioneered uh, in federal government parlance flexible work. Mika Cross, welcome again. Thank you so much, Ed, for having me. I appreciate it. So nice to see you. Thanks. Now, we're going to circle back to you in a few minutes. But in the meanwhile, if you do have a question or somebody else, just chat it or just let me know and uh, we'll get you right in. Jana Chesanowski uh, is uh, well known in the mobility circles. Uh, once again, she's in Rio de Janeiro and she's involved with immigration and mobility for an energy company, right, Jana? Exactly. I'm the responsible for the global mobility here at Brunel in Brazil. Uh, it's a Dutch company and it's always a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you. And in the southern uh, UK, Chaba Todd is with us. Hello, Chaba. Hi. Great. Uh, tell us me. about uh, your new book. Uh, it's not so new anymore. It's a big seller out there about uh, Uncommon Sense for Crazy Times or something like that, right? Pretty much correct. It's Uncommon Sense in Unusual Times and that's exactly correct. So this is all about teaching Uncommon Sense, which is the ability to see the same situation from different perspectives so we can make better decisions. And that is the goal. It's, it's almost like the cure for the biggest problem we have is the binary thinking. If you are not like me, you are against me. Case closed. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, you're involved on, on a global consultancy project called ICQ and the Global Disc. Do you want to do about 10 seconds on that? That would be really quick. I mean, Global Disc is the blueprint of why people think and behave differently. And because 95% of our actions are driven by values and beliefs, we're not even aware of it, but we think that we are so objective. So the goal is to understand ourselves better so we can understand others even better. But that's the missing part because often people want to get rid of this part because what if you find something nasty? And usually we do, but at least we can deal with it. Okay, great. So we're going to get back to you and we're going to go uh, uh, and do a deep dive on that. Uh, I just want to adjust this thing a little bit here. All right, let's, uh, let's quickly move on. Fiona Sitkin is from New yeah. Jersey area. <laughs> she's been on our programs yeah. before. Uh, and uh, she's author of several books. One of them is How They Made It in America. And it's right. about women who are immigrants. And you have a talk show that's really growing well also. So Fiona, we're going to come back to you in a few minutes. But sure. why don't you just really, really quickly introduce yourself better than I just did. Um, I belong to the mobility industry, not because, uh, not only because I traveled everywhere and lived in Europe and the uh, settlings and in America, but because after uh, Ariana Huffington invited me, I did writing on hot, hot topics, immigration and women. So, I mean, this is where I belong and based on 100 something interviews, I then wrote a book, How They Made It in America, Success Stories and Strategies of 18 Immigrant Women. Very, very diverse, like yourself, ladies, from <laughs> Isabella Lianda to Ivana Trump to fashion designer Judy Natori plus more. So, I mean, I am one of you. Yeah, that's cool. Welcome. Mary Lou Kay and I have known each other a number of years. She has spoken at our Miami events in live. Uh, going back a ways and has been on our TV show and our radio show. Mary Luque, what are you doing today besides this? Huh. Oh, you're not on. Sorry. Yeah. I'm coaching uh, international clients as they uh, settle here in U.S. coming from different parts of the world. And I'm also teaching human resources certification. So uh, staying quite busy these days, actually. Right, and you're in Tampa, and good luck yes. in the Super Bowl. Oh, uh, thank you. We're <laughs> let's, <excited>. let's, <laughs> yeah, let, let's quickly move on to Andrew Bruzzi before we go to Yvonne Quay. Andrew Bruzzi, welcome again. Thanks so much for, I know you're really busy now with, with AR and VR and AI and how it all relates to the talent mobility business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for the invite, uh, Ed, and I uh, Appreciate seeing everyone. I see some new faces, uh, many familiar faces. So it's a 
pleasure. And for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, again, my name is Andrew Bruzzi. I lead Venium Global, which is an HR consultancy firm that specializes in uh, global mobility, AI, and also uh, diversity inclusion is a big initiative. And especially in the U.S., with it being uh, the beginning of Black History Month, this is a very important month for us. So uh, exciting times, and uh, we've been working on a number of very good initiatives. But very glad to be speaking the topic, and again, appreciate the invite, Ed. You bet, and thank you, Stefan Compin from Luxembourg. Uh, so congratulations on your launch of a new business. Why don't you very, very quickly, 10 seconds for now, and then we'll come back to you later for more. But what is your new business to launch today? Uh, hi, Ed, uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, so today we just launched our second business, which is um, an au pair agency in Luxembourg. So it's a brand new and officially launched today. That's great. Okay, now everybody, once again, if you haven't already, use that chat. Say what your name is, your email, your website, your LinkedIn. It's very okay. Uh, don't solicit during the show, please. Okay, Ali Shami uh, has uh, been a live, live speaker <laughs> at our meetings in Silicon Valley and uh, Seattle, of course. And Canada. Yeah, yeah, just so many places. So, Ali, what are you doing today besides this? All right, thanks. Thanks for the uh, invite. I'm looking forward to learn from everybody. I'm a uh, retired senior manager from Boeing. I spent 30 years in corporate. I, uh, after I retired, I uh, started a company. I'm the uh, founder and the uh, leader in a company called FTD Global. It's a global uh, leadership um, consulting company connecting uh, manufacturers and customers but at the same time, I provide uh, doing business across cultures, training, cultural awareness work. So I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing from, from uh, to listening, to learning from everybody. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to begin uh, in just a minute. Um, and uh, our first speaker will be Yvonne Quay from the World Bank Family Network. And she'll be okay, following. I don't want to be mean, Ed, but can I say hi? Who's talking here? Lauren Cohen. Oh, where are you? I'm I right up. You. I don't know where I am on your screen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you. Yes, of course. Lauren okay. Cohen. Yes. Well, we're not. Hi. Related, I mean, I have the same I last name as you. The least I could do is get to say hi, you know? Yeah, well, I have uh, other people. Oh, I see. You have another name on your screen there. Oh, my God. Right. Right. Uh, Who's okay. Craig? Yeah. That's right. Sorry about that. That is not good. Hold <laughs> and, on. I'm changing it and now. then also, Rebecca, we'll get to you in just a second. And if there's anybody else who wants to yell and scream, please do it in just a minute. All right. Well, it's I'm never shy. So, you know, that goes with the last name Cohen. Ali, are you in That's Canada? That's for sure. Ali, are you in Canada? I guess if you were with Boeing, you're probably in Canada, right, Ali? Yeah, actually, very close to Canada. I'm in Seattle. Okay, cool. So anyway, hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Cohen, originally from Toronto, now in South Florida. I'm an international lawyer and realtor. I have a relocation business, but my specialty is helping people invest, live, work, and play across borders. I actually had Ed on my new podcast a few months ago. It's actually launched in November. It's called Investing Across Borders. So I work with people like you handling all that legal stuff and dealing with investing and bringing people from other countries into the US and Canada. I'm still licensed in Canada and very proud to be. Right. So I'd um, love to connect with you. So Lauren has uh, several businesses. One of them is called eCouncil Global. Yes. Why don't you use the chat and write that in because we have to move along here. Sure, I did, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay, Rebecca, please say hi and introduce yourself. What company are you with? Uh, hi, I'm Rebecca. Uh, I currently live in uh, in the U.S. in uh, Washington D.C. area. Uh, I work uh, in market intelligence uh, for a big retail company, uh, but I'm here today, I guess, because of my podcast that I recently launched, which is my passion project. It's called The Leading Female Insider, and I'm interviewing uh, inspiring individuals, and they are talking about you know their story. Uh, they give insights about their their the area that they are knowledgeable in, whether they are entrepreneurs or they work in corporate, and we talk about you know career, business, and life. And uh, just uh, 
launched four months ago. And in the first three months, uh, I actually made it into the top 100 podcasts and Apple podcasts on four countries in Europe, um, among which was uh, Denmark, Iceland, uh, Italy, and Hungary. And we even made it to uh, number one in Iceland. So I'm very much in the beginning of the journey, but it's very exciting. And I'm always excited to be connected with uh, inspiring individuals. So feel free Thank to you. reach out and be connected. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Yvonne Kwai uh, is with the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and she's a change manager uh, with uh, the Family Network, the World Bank Group Family Network. Hi, Yvonne. Welcome back to Global TV. I think this is your third or fourth time. And are you in D.C. today or are you, are you still in Europe? Oh, uh, we're back in D.C. We've been, we've been back for a month already. Thank you, Ed. So we're here. Let's know. Yeah. So very briefly, before you get into um, our our topic today about uh, aggressive women or roles that uh, women have been given, um, and about the difference between aggressive uh, women or assertive men, okay, and how does all that relate to you when you deal with change management in the World Bank Family Network? Well, thank you, Ed, for having me as usual. Uh, World Bank Family Network, just let me say that we are part of the World Bank Group, but what we do is we support spouses and their f and families as they move. So we're slightly different. We partner with HR, but we're not part of HR. Uh, but of course, as you all know, if you're in the global mobility field, that the unseen partner, the accompanying spouse, or partner plays a great role in the success of the assignment and even the ROI that you get. So that's the context or the reason for our being is to increase the ROI for the World Bank Group by supporting the families and particularly in this case, the partners, because many people are very uh, dual, uh, are dual career couples. So that comes to that whole thing about career, career privilege, and uh, in response to, to, to what uh, Ed was asking, you know, so often I think, and Rebecca, I'm sure you have something to add on that, uh, the same behavior that a woman exhibits is perceived as aggressive, particularly in the corporate setting. But if the man does the same thing, everybody goes, oh, he's very assertive. He knows what he wants. So I think, you know, th those are the sorts of things that uh, we need to address. But more important, I think, is the woman herself, which I'm coming to see more and more, is women and handed identities. And I think it's uh, something very deep inside of ourselves uh, that we have roles that, you know, when it comes to career, I see, when push comes to shove, it's always the women. Who give up when you, you start out fine as two dual as a couple dual career but when family comes in to the picture automatically there is an assumption that it's going to be the woman who's going to take to take the back seat and it's not just the men who think the women will the women also think they will and this is this is the whole point I think if so we want to move forward we need to think about you know, what are the handed identities that we carry with us? Hmm. So the issue of dual career is, gets in the way, of course. I mean, dual career depend. I mean, dual career, you have on two levels, I see. Issues that you have, whether you move or you don't move, that's the conversation. If both of you have high-powered careers and you have a family, it's how do you do it? In our case, what we add to the complexity is high impact mobility, we expect our staff to move every three to four years. And that really, really uh, can, if you don't manage your careers, uh, have a toll because not every country, and those of you who are immigration lawyers know, it's not that easy to, to work in every country around the world. So uh, let me uh, jump in for a second. I wanna introduce Diane Ayers, uh, who uh, comes to us from Ohio. She's uh, been in business, uh, CEO, found her own business several years ago. 
So Diane, would you like to comment on what Yvonne was just talking about? Well, we definitely see what she's saying is true. I would say the male tends to be the lead still. I've been in mobility for over 30 years. Um, Porchlight is my business and it's been in business going on 18 years here in May. And we continue to see when you have families, the male does continue to be the lead. It has definitely increased for females over the years, but you would, you would think some of that would start to change and it's, it's slowly increasing. And whether that's good or bad is up to all of us here to determine on our own, but it is the reality of it. But I'm also happy to say we see a lot of mobility for women in that younger group. I think prior to families, you see all of that mobility and freedom and them taking advantage of accelerating their careers differently. And when children are in the mix, you know, you make choices and everyone has to make them. So that's my input for now. Okay, we're gonna get back to you for more. I wanna to go to Saudi Arabia and Sandra Corona. Uh, you have a similar approach. Uh, it's all about messaging, isn't it? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, about the issue of uh, men versus women uh, and harassment and messaging. Uh, would you like to talk about that for a bit? And then we're gonna come back to you. We'll talk about Saudi Arabia later, but just I just wanna get a conversation going because we have very limited time. Sure. So yeah. Uh... It's a very hard topic, right? A lot of people, when they talk about harassment, um, it's not usually something that people come forward with. And uh, based on my own experience, I think that if we talk about roles, uh, we are still in a prehistoric mindset when it comes to women supporting other women. Uh, it's a very difficult situation to be in. Let's say, for example, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. This topic is very, very sensitive. And, uh, uh, you know, when you are a professional, a woman that's trying to succeed, to do your thing, you're going to the office, you're minding your own business, and uh, suddenly you have men that think that they have access to you simply because of how you dress or how you behave, or they misinterpret messages, right? Because again, it's all about uh, how you interpret information is how things can go really, really bad. Or, you know, you find that you're able to have control of the situation, which normally never does it ever go our way, right? So. Uh, when you talk about harassment in the office, I think that women need to support women so much more. We need to be able to, I'm not asking for compassion. I'm not asking for resilience. I think what we need to do is start thinking about how we can support the women in the office versus promoting chit chat because us being the promoters of that leads men to think that it's okay. There's women that enable these, these predators in the office by us behaving how we behave. And I would like to see a little bit more support by speaking up. And if you are a victim of this, don't ever, ever regret saying it. Because when the years come, you're going to regret it. Thank you, Sandra. Let's go back to Yvonne. She's very limited on time today, and we want to give you the stage, Yvonne. It's about storytelling. I mean, what story do you tell yourself, right? Uh, yes, I, I'm beginning to see now how powerful that is, uh, because I think, you know, our mindset shapes what we do. So if we tell the story of, like, I'm just a woman, I mean, that word just... Uh, I hear that very often. I'm just a homemaker. You know, th what are we telling of ourselves about our struggles? What have we heard other people say about us? Uh, those sorts of things. The, and I go back to handed uh, uh, identity because say for instance, just my own story, I come from a very uh, progressive family. 
my grandmother was the first Asian woman to come to university in the US. But we were always raised with the, uh, but when push comes to shove, it's always the man's career. And she wore it like a badge of courage that, you know, she's so well educated. Actually, my dear grandmother used to say, well, just look at me. I'm born with a silver spoon. I'm educated and I never had to work. But I mean, my grandmother would have been 120 if she's alive. So generations have changed. But I think those handed identities are deeper. So my question then is what stories are we women telling about ourselves? Okay, Sarah Tabbitt. Yes, I'm here, Ed. Yeah, okay, I know you've got a time constraint also, so I'm trying to be accommodative. Um, so your book is about diversity and it starts with you, right? Or you yes, it's, it's about diversity and inclusion and how inclusion can really start with everyone. Uh, it doesn't have to be a corporate topic, it, you don't have to be a CEO to be inclusive. So uh, it's really not only a corporate topic, but a social and individual topic. Okay, Yvonne, in your network and change management, uh, how much do you dive into this? How deep do you go? Uh, with, in my workshops called the Career Lab, I do this exercise. And what, what is so interesting is uh, I don't, it's one and shortest exercise because I believe it's very private. And because we're not doing therapy, I don't actually ask anybody to share the stories of what they tell themselves. I encourage them to do it. And when we have done evaluations and we've got, you know, evaluations over two and a half years, they always say that's a pivotal moment. But they change the stories they told about to themselves, the story they tell themselves. They will be able to change what happened and one of them said I did the exercise and I phoned my ex-boss and now I'm got a consultancy I have never asked her what she told herself except to say that I can see what I tell myself and how it affects the choices I make Make a cross you've been involved in the federal government uh, from a, a labor point of view uh, what do you see happening today well, you know, I think all the best future focused players are really looking at this issue holistically from an inclusion perspective, too. In fact, I put some comments in the chat around considerations about same sex partners and spouses as well, and gender identity that are emerging in our workplaces. So no longer is it just, you know, a woman and man issue, but it could potentially be how people are identifying as well. Um, I come from a very traditional background, just to let you know. I mean, I also come from a very male-dominated career. Uh, coming from the U.S. Army, I was enlisted and also a military officer. I worked for the United States intelligence community after 9-11 and then worked across the United States government, the nation's largest employer, working in a lot of policies and programs. And I think the key is to create an inclusive and engaged employee experience where people no matter how you identify or how your experiences are differing from someone else's, have a voice. And that leadership really takes ownership around how are you going to create an inclusive and collaborative workforce where everyone feels like they have a voice at the table, a seat at the table, and are included in solutions to, to move the bottom line forward and, and to make the workplace better. And if you don't have that, I mean, that's where you need to start. So those are some of the things I work with um, employers, also in private industry, nonprofit, academia, and how can you create future-focused, inclusive workplaces to get the best out of uh, people's work? I think, you know, to Sandra's point, in a traditional workplace where you can see people and, you know, things matter, like your office space, your body language, the way you dress, when you translate that into a remote work environment, you sort of strip away some of those intricacies that otherwise would be affecting people in the workplace. And it 
really is important to groom a whole nother set of competencies, especially amongst your leadership team, to be able to uh, assess workers based on their output and productivity and impact rather than line of sight and uh, what they're doing physically in the office. Because as we've seen over the past year, many employers are now embracing a new way of working and they will continue to do that on the rise for those positions that are suitable for doing so. So, so I wanna jump in and just uh, add, uh, Mika and I have known each other a number of years. And at the time she was in the Department of Labor uh, in a, sen a senior position, but, uh, and then did a lot of multi-agency uh, crossover work, but it was all about getting the organization to accept virtual, to accept flex time, correct? Yeah, for years, um, you know, almost two decades, in fact, I've been working on, on this topic. And, and really, it takes a level of customization and understanding the culture um, in order to make it work really well. And it's not a one size fits all approach. You know, what's going to work well for one organization and one employer is not going to be the same solution that works for another. So it's figuring out, again, that that sort of corporate competencies and how you're going to be able to apply work flexibility as a strategy. And when you consider the trailing spouse or partner issue, which is so incredibly important for those who are in the talent acquisition and management fields, right? Um, I put another comment in the box about what we're thinking about on a national scale for military spouses and how that can actually be considered a, a, a topic of national security when the trailing spouse or partner is not able to continue and sustain income in their career and their spouse or partner is deployed um, and being able to do that while also managing all of the responsibilities of the home front. So these are things that are being looked at on a national policy level. Um, and also, again, looking at ways to implement strategically workplace flexibility for a future focus. Yvonne, before you have to leave, uh, if you could just summarize the, the network that you're in and how that works uh, around the world, okay? Yvonne? Oh, you have to put your sound on. Have to put your sound on. Uh, okay. One thing I did want to say, actually, in response to Sandra, and I think we can all help each other, because when we just speak up and to be more inclusive, say supposing we're in a meeting, and I see that Sandra said something, and the leader of the meeting just bypassed Sandra, we can help each other by looping back and say, Ed, I really do think that one moment, one moment, my phone is going, just, just, just a sec. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. I think that, you know, what we can actually do is we can actually say, hey, you know, uh, so-and-so, uh, Ed wanted to say something, uh, uh, Sandra wanted to say something, Ed. So I think, you know, if we all just do these, what I call little steps, we can help each other. Women can help women, especially when, a quiet woman is being talked over uh, in a meeting. Those of us who are watching can say, wait a minute, you know, I really think Fiona would like to say something or maybe, you know, how the, the, the man versus woman and actually Fiona said it first and a man co-ops it. If you see that happening, I think you can say, I think Fiona said that earlier. And I think those little droplets uh, will help. So we go back to what we, what was your question? Sorry, I was so excited about the first <laughs> point about helping each other. About what was your question, work. Ed? Yeah, uh, you as a, a change agent for the World Bank Family Network yes. and its members around the world, uh, you you into a deep dive on this uh, offline, I'm sure. Yes, I mean, we help. I mean, I really try most of all because I know the most important thing for them is career and that's what they want most. So for me, I see myself as helping them to reframe that career, uh, look at their handed identities and say, who says I have to follow? And if I am going to follow, how can I follow uh, uh, well with some autonomy, not that I'm being dragged, you know, wherever. And that it just start to think about different ways that 
both the couple, I mean, regardless of whether it's same sex or, or, or heterosexual, it doesn't matter. Couples are couples, people who want to live together. It's, it, it's asexual in, in an odd sort of way. It's that if I want to choose to live my life with someone else, and we both have career ambitions, how can we do this well? So Sarah Tabit, uh, you're a global HR director with a large uh, famous company, Schneider Electric, and you're involved in the uh, Middle East, uh, and which is, uh, of course, a male dominated area. So you must live with this every day, all day. Well, it's, it's true that some of the topics that we talk about globally uh, in the Middle East, uh, similar to what Sandra has mentioned in, in Saudi, in Dubai, uh, we, we, you know, across the, across the Gulf region, um, we, we still need to create a lot of awareness. So it's really beyond going back to fixing the basics. There are a lot of topics that we cannot yet talk about. So LGBTQ, of course, is not something that we can talk openly about or do at least, even, even if I work in a global organization where we uh, openly support as part of our inclusive um, uh, culture, uh, uh, LGBTQ, but, but in this region, we cannot do a lot of activities around it or really be vocal, uh, be vocal about it. Uh, but a lot has been done uh, government-wise, corporate-wise on creating awareness about the topic of diversity and inclusion, the topic of women, women giving more uh, roles for women in, in the corporate and, you know, even in the, in, in the political uh, environment. So a lot is, is, is being done, but it's still on the awareness uh, side, um, uh, taking into account that there's a lot of cultural uh, backgrounds also that needs to be tapped into. So, um, so of course the sky is the limit, but there's a lot, a lot, a long journey yet um, to get to where, uh, of course, maybe uh, America or, or North America or, or the U.S. in general, the topics that are being discussed, uh, discussed there, or the actions that are being taken. Yeah, Sandra, would you like to comment? No, I, I mean, that was what Sarah mentions is very clear. That's very true. Um, obviously, uh, the countries, every single country in the world is in a certain process of evolution, uh, some kind of progress stage, different than in every other country in the world. And one of the problems that a lot of people have is that for those that don't get to travel much or don't travel at all, at all is that they think still in that mentality that the Middle East is a third world country. And they think about it in general, not just mentally, but economically, uh, financially, everything is third world country, when in reality, it's not. The country might not be, you know, screaming it out loud, hey, we're doing this, we're doing that. But those of us that live here, feel it. We no longer have to wear the abaya. We, yes, we do have to dress conservative, but that is a huge step when it comes to expat mentality. Being able to drive, that is another huge step. It gives us the liberty, the, the idea of saying, I'm a little bit more independent. There's other things that yes, still need to work, but the fact that at least those main things are, are working for us as women, that's a huge step. And being able to work freely and men accepting that, you should see the faces of men. It's it's like they like to see women drive still after three years. They still like to see women drive. And that's, that's amazing. Yeah. So Yana, Ina, what do you think about all this? I couldn't agree more with Sandra. I think we are, uh, I'm here in another part of the world and I feel the same that we are uh, facing this evolution and all the little steps, they're not little. <laughs> and we need to, to, to support each other. I just uh, wanted to mention, uh, based on the topics that you guys have been mentioned before, it's that uh, we are really proud here uh, because I was, I think like during COVID last year, everything, uh, all the issues, they got, uh, got our attention in another level. So we just launched uh, a support for the sponsors here in Brazil for uh, to find job for, it's not just for women, it's for the sponsors, but because we saw this 
the impact of how sad it is for women at here in Brazil, the law allows them to work when they are uh, co-expectating and not having the, the chance to, to, to have the support and to know how they need to, to find help for the job, where the companies that are open to, to support them. And it's been really awesome to see uh, the results, to see the great impact that we are, that we are bringing not only to uh, the families, but for the companies to bring this awareness. And so it, it's, it's simple because it's what we do here at Brunel. We support on recruitment and outsourcing. And uh, when I realized that we could offer something that we already have been doing for years, but in a different way, giving a special eyes to, to the sponsors when they are relocating, it's, it's been awesome. So, and everything came from connecting and hearing from each other. So I really value this. Uh, all these talks that we have the chance to hear and uh, connect. Yeah, before I go to Ali and a couple of others, um, Yana Ina, tell us about your work with the uh, UN Civil Ra Human Rights uh, Pursuit. Yeah, so I'm Brazilian delegate. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, last year the, the event was canceled and this year we will have everything uh, virtually. But the whole thing is... Uh, it's the CSW with the events that uh, we get together, women from all over the world, and we talk about uh, the challenges. And of course, we celebrate the, 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 the things that we conquered during the years. And we find ways to, to, to support each other in a way to give women and girls uh, the opportunity to believe in themselves and to know that it's possible. And as you were being saying, like that we can support uh, in every way. So, and it's fantastic to see that we are evolving. Uh, sometimes feels that it's slowly, but when we look at back, we we are we are going. We already have reached far, and I'm sure we are just uh, accelerating this whole process. And when we uh, work together, not only as women, but as humans, uh, we just make it even better and faster. Uh, quickly, I'd like to go back to Sandeepta in India. It's uh, late where you are, also for Sarah, so we just want to get you in before you have to depart. Sandeepta, you're, you're working for a company involved internally with immigration, and you're known to take the wrinkles out and make it seamless, right? Yes, yes. I am a global. Uh, I am an immigration and global mobility specialist currently with my organization. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself again. I'm Sandeepta Jadav. I'm based in Mumbai in India. Since 2004, I am in associated with leading corporations and uh, delivering services in the area of immigration and people mobility. Thank you very much. Welcome. Ali Shami in Seattle. Um, with your new company and your new consultancy about uh, getting behind uh, business issues and into human issues, right? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I've been, I've been waving. So I, I, I know how women feel in, the, in corporate when they want to raise their hand and say, I'm here, I'm here. So I felt it a long time ago. I just wanted to, uh, <laughs> but I've, um, I just wanted to underscore. I mean, everybody made some great, great points, and I wanted to underscore what Ivan, too bad Ivan took off before, um, and in 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 the sense that um, we we need to support each other. But I know in this in conferences in discussions like these, uh, there are two benefits. The first one is is to hear somebody else saying, oh, this is the problem. So we have that confirmation. That, okay, we know this is what the problem is. Um, and so we support each other in knowing that knowledge, that information or data is actual true knowledge. But the other in intent of these discussions is to ask these questions to get us to go above what the current challenges that we have. So you can look at, I, I, my question is what, how come everybody feels like it's the leadership style of men is the best and everybody wants to be like successful as men? Who said that men have the best leadership style? Why don't we get out of who is 
and let's let's all support each other. Um, I see you see a lot of um, allies in men who want women to be successful because that's the right thing to do. And so, so I say, I say, let's not look for option A or option B. Let's look for option C and let's put our heads together and figure out what can we do. Now, I understand in situations, every country has its own challenges. Like to Sandra's point, every, you know, every country has its own challenges that we have to work locally to solve them. But I really encourage us that we can, we look globally and find out what is really that global leadership style because we all need each other and we all need to support each other. Stephen Howard, you're an expert in helping leaders develop even when it's difficult. I knew you were gonna throw that to me, Ed. I just had a feeling about that. Thank you. <laughs> Ali's correct. And I, you know, I would add on what you know what Yvonne said about women supporting each other. It's, men have to support. I mean, if you if, if us men, if we see a woman being ignored in a meeting, we need to also do the same thing. It's not just the women who need to speak up. We need to say, you know what, Sandra, you know, Sandra had that point, so to speak. But you know, when it comes to leadership today, whether it's male or female, I think um, you know, the old control and command style no longer works. Uh, and neither does fear. And I think too many men and too many women have tried to lead from that control and command style. They try to lead from that fear, put the fear of God in you, so to speak. Um, leaders today, they need to be inspirational. They need to be authentic. They need to be able to collaborate and encourage collaboration. And they need to share authority and decision making. And that, I don't care whether you're male or female. That's what's going to be successful. And the more that anybody, supervisor, first line leader, manager, vice president, CEO exhibits those things, the more successful they're going to be and the more successful their organization is going to be. Andrew. Oh, sorry, it took me a second to go off mute. Yes, these are all phenomenal points. Um, so what, one recommendation that I have and that we, we bring up with our clients whenever we're encouraging them to kind of create a culture of championing um, diversity and inclusion and things like uh, advancing women in to leadership positions is that everyone, regardless of gender or um, any um, any personal factor, should have three people in their lives in the workplace. One is going to be their uh, mentor. The mentor will help guide them to, hey, what decision should I make? Should I go into this role, career pathing, that type of thing? As soon as you figure out where you're going, you should have your sponsor that will generally be a senior level leader that will help get you into that role. Someone to take kind of the political role for you. And then the uh, third is going to be your champion. So someone that is your eternal cheerleader that will back you up through everything. So by having those three people in your life, you kind of overcome any of the political issues of the organization. You're given the guidance that you may not even know the questions to ask. And then you always have advocates that are there for you with you every single day that I think biologically people wanna help each other. And that, and Ali brought up a, a very good point that who knows what the proper leadership style is. And so the best thing to do is be your own CEO of your own company. And even if you are working for someone else and advocate your business, because ultimately you're the one that's supporting that organization in being successful and you're selling your services to them as an employee and they will then promote you in kind, regardless of any uh, differentiating factor, which is um, most of the time what actually adds value to the organization. Stefan, in Luxembourg, and you're in a family business, so you have a firsthand experience with uh, uh, equality, right? Yes, um, I mean, for, for me, it's not an issue. I've always worked with an environment where I had a lot of women around me, even in the moving industry. Um, so it has not been an issue. I think the, the main problem, and um, I, I've put it in the chat, is that there is a problem of education in families. Um, there is still this issue of you are a boy, uh, you, are, um, you are a girl, and, and you are growing up like that. And, um, I think this needs to change um, and it needs to change in the education at school as well, uh, because it, this will bring a new generation um, that will not accept that there is a gender difference in the, in the working environment. And um, 
again, I, I mean, I really in, enjoyed all the, the points and comments that were uh, uh, given uh, tonight because um, uh, they are all true. Uh, women uh, need to support men that deserve it and the same uh, for, for, for women. And uh, I, I think also one issue is that some of the women are not um, willing or able to speak up uh, when they, you know, want a promotion, want to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, give their IDs. Um, is it because um, uh, of education? Is it because of uh, business pressure? Difficult to know, but uh, that's, that's a big issue as well. Yeah, Fiona Sitkin, uh, uh, you're, you're not a wallflower. You always no. speak up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy the discussion. Thank you for inviting me, Ed. Your conferences and online discussions are equally star value. Um, uh, so I enjoyed it. But personally, I am now moving to more practical solutions. You know why? Because the pandemic underscored the lower attention span. This attention span lowered dramatically. And Previously, I thought that writing a book about star women, star leaders would be good enough. Now, not anymore, I see. And I moved almost intuitively to uh, do the interviews online, created my own channel, YouTube channel, and started interviewing first my book subject and then other star women who have interesting ideas and have something to say and uh, can respond to my questions and we analyze different, different world events. So YouTube um, appreciated it. They made me partner because of content. And the channel is now 5,000 subscribers strong and uh, counting. And um, YouTube uh, gives me... Uh, their own um, coaching, how to be a better creator because I am now among their creators. So, and I'm, I'm trying, they're pushing me like, like hell, you know, but you know, I'm still, I'm still moving uh, to my own pace. And uh, I would like now to invite you, come to my channel. And although I interview women and because this is by definition by women for women talk show this is all also for female um, um not only for females but for male feminists so to speak you know like i see all men here are pro women this is great so um recommend something to me i am looking forward to bringing more interesting women. Why? Because this is my old idea and it still works very well. How to improve women's position. We need to showcase women role models. So women understand that womankind is not some, some you know, species to look down at. You know, condescending approaches are not acceptable. Thank God we have now um, people on top who understand and appreciate women more. And in the government, we see more women. So my idea is the more the merrier, ladies and gentlemen, please bring me valuable people with their interesting ideas so we could showcase them and you know, inject more confidence in those women who typically would stand behind. Either because of upbringing, they're too shy, you know, brought up like a woman. I was like my, myself, you know, brought up like a woman, you know. You need not to say something until you are asked. For God's sake, you know, that's the upbringing. But <laughs> the new generation, the new generation is the new generation. Let's do our best to inject confidence in them, to show them the role models who are leaders to follow. 
So I want to introduce Mark Colo, who has young daughters. Mark, why don't you say hi and introduce yourself and uh, the talk about your family. Uh -huh. I, I'd be happy to, Ed. Thank you. I was waiting for someone in the group to say, hey, Mark hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> but I guess I have to wait for a little bit longer for that. Um, good to be on your show, Ed. Good to see familiar faces. Uh, good to be with you again. Um, I've been in the mobility business for about 40 years. Uh, I have three children, uh, ages, uh, uh, let's see, 24, 22, and 18. <clears throat> and my 18-year-old my is very much into the movement of genderless, uh, being genderless. That's a strong movement among our youth. And to be honest, I wouldn't want to be a youth in, in this day and age. I think it'd be too difficult. But uh, it's just hard times. I, th I think our youth are caught up in what I call fad. That's fear, apathy, and doubt. I think they're fearful of the future. Many of them are, 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 are apathetic about the outcome of their lives. And many, many of them think that, that uh, you know, the future is not, not going to be a happy place. So I feel for, for, my, for my child, my children, and for others' children. Um, in my spare time, I write books. Uh, I've written two books now, so I guess that makes me um, an author, I guess. Um, Stephen on the on on the on the call today. Stephen with the the fan looking palm hairdo behind him. Um, he was my editor, and he's great. Great. I want to put in a plug for him. He does a great job. And uh, um, uh, I don't know, Ed. I don't know what else you want me to say, but that's that's probably good enough, I guess. That's good. Let's go back to Chava Toth. Well, you've been pretty quiet here, but uh, I'm sure you're taking it all in for your next book. So, so Chava, what, what say you? I think this is a really difficult topic and maybe it sounds a bit controversial, but I think sometimes giving more rights to another group in the spirit of equality doesn't really achieve the goal. So sometimes I think the problem is that we overdid political correctness and it prevents people from being able to talk about things. And I can tell you a really personal example. When I came here to the UK for the first time, then I wanted to get on the train and it was a weird situation. And there was a lady in front of me and I said, ladies first. And then she asked me, is it because I'm a woman? And you know, I was naive and innocent and I said, yes. And then she started shouting at me and all those things. And I thought, wow, and I was a chauvinistic pig and whatever. And I thought, that is surprising because you know, in Hungary, you do that not because the women are less than you, it's because you show respect. But at the same time, I understand that maybe her experience was different, but I think it's a two-sided story. And maybe we have to let our baggage go and then we start from scratch. So focusing on inclusion rather than diversity because diversity exists, inclusion doesn't. That's more difficult to get it right. Yes. And we also mentioned the really important topic that it starts with self-inclusion. If you are insecure, if you have low self-esteem, then you really have to bully people to feel important. You have to hide to feel safe. But if you know exactly who you are, what you stand for, and you're also okay with it, and let's push the boundaries, you even like yourself, which is quite rare, then you can be inclusive towards others, but not until then. Because if your self-esteem depends on external source of approval, it's a really fragile place. It's really stressful. So let's aim for inclusion, but it starts with us. And that's the most difficult part. Let's go to Diane Ayers. That, Diane has uh, been a friend for a number of years and is one of our original sponsors. Thank you again, Diane. So this has uh, been an interesting conversation. And uh, from a business owner's point of view and American from Ohio, uh, all this <laughs> diversity and inclusion here on the show, what say you about all those? I am just in awe of what I'm listening to, number one. And, and somebody typed in a chat over here about how so much of this really is just what we don't control because of how we are raised. We can't help, you know, who our parents are and what we are trained to know or believe or just what we're exposed to as they are only teaching what they're exposed to. And to really take this in a different direction, my daughter works for a foundation where they lift a lot of families in poverty and different situations that they're in. And, and let me tell you, that, that's what I'm thinking about as we're talking about this, because it's, it's such a cycle 
everything we've just talked about is a cycle of your experiences and your environment. And yes, broadening your horizons through the many books and authors that we have here and through travel and our mobility experiences. If we don't have those things, we only know our world, right? So it, it's just such a big topic, Ed, and I love the deep thinking and the conversation. But as a business owner, when you invite people into your organization and interview them, you are starting there. I'm starting there. I'm starting with who they are and what they're about. And all of that has to do with their life experiences and what they bring to the table and where we reach those people. Cause they're not always going to be in Cleveland, Ohio, where I am, they're going to be in other places and how you really get to the core of who they are and what they can bring to your organization and how you help grow them. And it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to have done this as, as old as I am, but I am learning I have so much farther to go. And so this has just been a great conversation. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Let's go back to Sandra Corona. Um, Sandra, I know you have a lot to say on this, and um, uh, I want to make sure that you have uh, enough time to uh, make you feel like this has been useful for you personally. Okay, well, um, so one of the things that I feel that, uh, you know, I think a lot of, we've come a long way. That's, that's the truth. From the time where, you know, we, I experienced what I experienced to this time, I think uh, people have come a, a long way. And number two, I think that it's a blessing now that uh, we have Zoom and that working from home is another option. Uh, I was thinking yesterday about the people that usually have a lot of projects going on and how they would be able to ask friends to help them or how other coworkers would stay and suddenly turn around and say, hey, I'm gonna go and help such and such because they have a lot of work to do. Nowadays, you don't have that. So I'm wondering, you know, how have people been able to juggle, you know, to continue doing what they were doing before, um, but now without all these coworkers around them. And the truth is that I'm pretty sure that a lot of cute people have come to the understanding and the reality that you need to ask for help, right? Now people have to be able to ask for help and not be ashamed to say, hey, you know what, this is too much work for me. I need some help, or you probably were going to want to have it or, or give it to somebody else. That's something that is also part of working as a group of supporting each, uh, all of us, because that, the truth is that being weak in our society and the American society is very hard. When you show that you have an ability to work and continue doing the job that you were to do, not being able to ask for help is, is not right. You should now, we should now normalize the fact that asking for help is, is right. It's, it's, it's a good thing, right? Because you're, you're, you're just putting yourself out there to say, look, I, you know, the, the truth is that I have all these things to do and I would like to ask for help. I think if we were to normalize um, the fact that our culture in the American culture, we've always said that if you cry or if you show some kind of weakness or if you ask for help, that's wrong. You are past. And a lot of women are past because of that. And also men. I have to say there's a lot of men that are also past because they look weak because they're not fitting the standards. So, you know, I think there's a lot that we can use towards improving ourselves. And I hope that we all start looking into this and start normalizing a lot of things that we tend to put like this little thing, you know, that it's wrong. It's, it's not wrong. We're human. And so Sandra, thank you for uh, sharing all that. I know it's been a difficult time for you. Uh, Mary Lou, uh, you've been counseling people a long time. Nope, you got to do your voice. 
sorry. <laughs> I do see these issues very much with the um, both the expatriates and their spouses. I see a mix of uh, male and female, but it really is important to provide some kind of support when they come to a new country and restart their careers. It's very challenging, and especially now in COVID, where they may have children at home, they're trying to find jobs. In some cases, they're perfecting their English. Uh, in other cases, they're trying to validate their foreign degrees and make sure that they can fit into the American job market. So it's quite challenging for them. And um, it can be an emotional roller coaster for them. They can't go back to their home countries and visit families. They're limited in what they can do here in the US. It's uh, just a very challenging time. So, so Andrew Bruzzi, uh, we've been talking about feelings and a lot of human stuff, which is, of course, real. Your approach uh, in your prior life in people activities for Walmart Corporation, and now you're doing this, but you're doing technological stuff. So how are you marrying, how are you bringing together tech in this human endeavor? Yes, that's a fantastic question. And uh, by the way, again, further, I, I, my neck is going to be hurting because I keep nodding and agreeing with all of your points. You, <laughs> everyone here has had a lot of brilliant points today, so I appreciate that. But, um, you know, I, I think um, uh, Chavez had a, uh, had a very good point of um, how I think there's been a breakdown in the idea of um, supporting people like uh, women in business or uh, diverse folks in business where we will put people into a bucket and we say that, oh, this is a, um, a person of X, Y, Z identifying characteristic when that I think is a failure to do that. Um, because if we're looking at um, what makes someone valuable to the organization, a large portion of that is how you drive innovation. That's the value of diversity. And all of this is to say that uh, what we do for the technolo uh, technology side of the house is by leveraging technology for things like skill assessments, skill tracking, making sure that people um, can voice what they're strong at. So then if you're looking for someone for a promotion or tracking something in talent management, then you can identify in an objective way where it's no longer the subjective, hey, I feel that Ed is really good at this, or I feel that Sandra is really good at this. It's I know they're good at this because of this objective metric. So then at that point, if we're looking at two people that may look the same, but are from different parts of the world, very vastly uh, different backgrounds, we're not just looking at the physically identifiable trait that makes them them. It's a, hey, this person's lived in five countries, they speak three languages, they um, have this educational background, this professional experience, that then makes them a, a asset to the organization in this capacity and where each portion of those diverse traits can then generate value. So long-winded way of saying that objective skill tracking and then removing some of the bias away from things like recruiting uh, and talent management. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Elena uh, from Stockholm. I really appreciate you jumping on. So why don't you briefly introduce yourself? We've been uh, talking for the last hour or so about uh, human issues. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you, uh, I, I, you know, I know you're an expert at this. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Ah, thank you. Um, well, I have a relocation and immigration company in Sweden. Uh, I founded it in 1995. So we're on our 26th year. And it's very human to move people across borders. And, and this is about women. And I can say then from a historical point of view, since I've been doing this for such a long time, in the very beginning, it was mostly men, almost exclusively men that moved with their jobs. And slowly but surely that has changed. And now I, I would say it's probably 50-50. We don't even think about it any longer. It's um, it's very evenly divided in the talent that comes here, apart from in the software sector, because then, then there would be more men than women, typically.
Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. Stefan, uh, you're launching a business with, with your wife, a life partner, uh, for au pair. So that means, for all of us who don't really understand that language, uh, that means uh, service to take care of kids. Is that right? Stefan? Stefan, hello? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, did you hear what I said? Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about your au pair service. Yes, so, uh, well, it, it, it just came out of the blue. We had a tender from the um, Luxembourgish government that came up and we decided to participate because we saw that it would be, um, it's kind of a continuity. We are, I mean, my our, our core business is um, uh, like Lena, uh, we are, uh, relocating people and uh, in a way uh, an au pair agency is to uh, you know help uh, young people to um, experience um, uh, an intercultural and multilingual um, uh, life in, in Luxembourg so um, yeah it's, it's ex exciting um, and when you know we are talking about dual careers and uh, and the COVID times where people are working from home um, I think it's a perfect time to launch such a, um, uh, a company because uh, there is a need. I mean, um, uh, I don't know how many me messages I had to answer today from people, uh, you know, uh, saying that it's a great idea and, uh, and asking, you know, uh, uh, how, how does it work? So, um, yeah, exciting times uh, despite, you know, this COVID situation. So I want to uh, tell all of you uh, something you probably already know is that if you need to be connected with uh, someone else that's been on the program, just reach out to me and I could be an intermediary, no problem, and of course, no cost. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for being on this program. We don't have to end it right this second, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, we want you to come back again. Our next program is March 1st on the same topic, and we have a, a basically a different cast, uh, which has really been interesting. But between now and March 1st, we do have some time available to go deeper into your own in particular topics. Uh, so let's communicate and we could set up some time, uh, not this week, but next week or the week after. So let's get back 
to Lena with the new shutdown and the disease and all that, it's, it's crazy making for you, isn't it? Yes, um, I, I think we're all quite nervous in Europe um, and not least in the UK. And, and that combined with Brexit, it does become a little bit difficult to anticipate what's going to, well, you, really we can't anticipate anything any longer. Things change it very, very quickly. And same thing with South Africa and yeah. new strains. But I think we can assume that it's already in Europe and we're trying to contain it as best we can, but maybe travel isn't uh, uh, the biggest problem. I don't so, know, what do you th say, the rest so, of you? So let me just jump in and say that I have had uh, dose number one of the vaccine, uh, the Moderna and there's been zero reaction at all. Then the next one's coming up um, in about uh, two weeks from now. And, you know, frankly, I can't wait, you know. Uh, I'm, f I'm feeling like I've got some kind of body armor on. Uh, and, uh, and I think everybody should do that. And, you know, if you're following the travel, the business travel news or some of the other commentary, companies are going to insist that everybody has, they won't make it a law, I don't think they can do that, but they can insist <laughs> that everybody gets vaccinated because everybody has to feel safe about being around other people. It just yes. stands to reason. And so uh, I'm not selling vaccines or anything. I'm just talking about my own experience of feeling actually safe and liberated. And, <laughs> I and, can imagine. You know, I, I want I you all to uh, find a place to go get that needle. So. <laughs> Uh, so, yes. so Fiona, what do you have your success O2 on your talk show? I mean, it's phenomenal. I wish I had 5,000 subscribers. Um, you know what? Um, success all depends on um, who I invite and how we work out the idea. What is your message? You know, how can you help me to promote you and your idea? And this is a chemistry. Um, you know, I, I learned to do interviews while for the half post blogging, but now I am working out it even further. So my um, message to you all is like call to action. Let's give more women leaders the floor. Let's have them speak. Let's have them heard more because empowering women is empowering America, empowering your country, it's empowering economy, empowering all of us. So I am all but willing to help if you want to promote some woman from your company or yourself for that matter, or another worthy woman, you know, I am all for it. And my um, link for the talk show is here. Um, in, I sent it in the messages. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, Fiona, thank you. Sandra Corona, thank you so much for sharing your time. I know it's late for you. And if, if you'd like to sum up, uh, I want to give the microphone to you. Thank you. Well, I, I think I wanted to talk about uh, misconceptions and what we tend to do. Uh, a lot of uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I've been reading the book from Malcolm Gladwell, which uh, Lena and I are working on something together on that. Uh, hopefully we'll have something next month, but we'll see. And um, the book from Malcolm Gladwell, which is Talking to Strangers, is how the, peop the person that tells the story has an agenda. Right. Also, when you look at these crime channels and I mean, I love them. Don't get me wrong. I've been binging on them for the past two months. And, uh, you know, you hear all these victim statements and all of these people telling the stories and everything else. And they have, like I said, they have an agenda and they're going to betray the person depending on what they want or what they're looking for. And even sometimes it's political, right? So I, I would tell people that without giving you know, much more than what I would like to say than, than what Lynn and I are working on, 
is when you look at these shows, you know, take them with a grain of salt. Just, just think a little bit about what they're telling you and what they're trying to communicate. Just give yourself the opportunity to think for yourself, do the research, because there's a lot of information that I'm also noting from Malcolm Gladwell that he has kept out with the purpose of creating a certain message, okay? And I get it, you know, he's a writer, he knows what he's doing, but we also have to be careful, we have to be informed. And this goes in general also in the workplace, it goes in how we work together and what we do day by day. Our perceptions, our misconceptions, our biases, everything we do on a daily basis is what makes this country be divided. Because in the past, nobody worried about what political party you were. I would just talk to you. I just liked you and that was it. But now everybody is like, oh, you know, she thinks this way, so she must be conservative. Or she talks this other way, so she must be this and that. So it's not the first thought that makes you racist. It's not the first thought that makes you be against a certain religion or, or race or whatever you want to call it. It's the second thought because first you're like, oh, I don't like this person. But then it starts with, oh, but he's Muslim or he is Catholic or he is whatever, whatever. We have to be careful with how we manage ourselves and what we think. And at least some of us are careful and we don't act on our actions, which is good, but perceptions is everything and communication. Sit down and talk with the person. That is part of global mobility. The only way that you can give good service is by listening. That's how we learn. So I hope that people get a lot out of this of today's show. Thank you for the opportunity to let me talk today. There's a lot of great topics that I hope to see covered a little bit more. Thank you. Ed. Thank you, Sandra. It. Ali, Shami, I'm sorry I kept the microphone away from you, but but now no, it's yours. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, just great, uh, great points. Um, I'm going to say something, and probably this is not the best time to say it, but hopefully, like maybe in six months or a year, uh, probably will be more acceptable. Uh, I just wish the only problem we have is the is COVID-19. Because you think it's not just the virus. There's so many viruses out there. It's our um, how what we think of ourselves, what we think of others. There's so many problems. You look at how many people died throughout the centuries. Um, it's all self-inflicted. It's the way we think about ourselves. We, th you know, as an immigrant, I relate so much to women in corporate because. Um, Women, when they grew up, they are the product, as we all are human beings, we're all the product of the environment that we grow up in. We get influenced, we get programmed, culturally programmed by our loved ones. As an immigrant, once you leave a country and you go to another country, boom, it's, it's a sudden thing. All of a sudden, you're a fish out of water. I've had the same, I relate to so many stories that, that uh, women talk about when they're in a meeting. I mean, in, in a, it, one that stuck, stuck in my mind is one time I was in a meeting with executives and I'm sitting down and, and I have my HR uh, executive right next to me and, and we're trying to solve a problem. And I said, okay, maybe we should, what do you guys think about this plan? And I finished, I didn't hear anything. Another gentleman, another executive just sitting right next to me said, um, I think what we should do is this. And everybody turned to him and said, exactly, that's what we should do. Good point. Guess what? That was exactly what I said. I, I was just overlooked completely. The HR executive looked at me. She said, please, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk. Don't do anything. And, and so, so I totally relate to that. I think, I think, um, I think there's a, uh, I believe that with, with the in, um, improvements, things that we're working, I mean, your best allies are, again, they're, male leaders who, who, um, who, who understand is more complete having male, female uh, teams together is better. I witnessed that. I've seen, I went from uh, executive leadership teams where we're all diverse, men and women, and, the, and, the, and the, the performance was this high to all of a sudden 
all male, and then the performance went way down because all of a sudden, everybody just went back to how they were culturally programmed and everybody was talking over everybody. And I'm like, guys, please, let's not do that. So women are needed as much as men are needed in a, in a, in a, in a team. You can also imagine probably if a team all are female, probably would have a different dynamics, right? Uh, maybe I may be wrong, but, uh, but so I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I'm, and, you know, I'm asking these questions. It may be uncomfortable, but it's really, really important is to get out of the, we need to help each other is we all need to help each other. It's not just minorities helping my, uh, each other. It's not just the majority realizing the minorities are taking over. It's everybody need to help each other as a humans. Chaba. Uh, I think you're the deepest philosopher here today, so <laughs> why, don't, why don't you uh, say something intelligent? Okay, that's, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but just reflecting on Ali's comments, it, it, you know, he, he was talking about cognitive diversity, which is technically the only layer of diversity that has proven benefit in terms of performance. And what, what you described there, for example, that you had only men, they were running on autopilot, they had women, and the performance was higher. So if you look at the neuroscience behind it, then often the reason is not that it is diverse, but it's different. So people pay more attention. They get out of the limbic brain and then suddenly they pay attention. And that's why the performance is there. So if you look at diversity, it is just the potential for success or disaster. It depends on how well you understand yourself and others. And that's why we have to focus on psychological safety and also inclusion. And then we can make it happen because we talked so much about culture, but culture is not who we are. It's what we are used to. That's a big difference there. So we can make our own decisions. We get what we tolerate and not making a decision or not saying anything is also a decision. And sometimes that is much worse than standing up for something that you believe in. So I do, it, it's something that we all need to do. But yeah. the problem is that if you overdo a strength, it becomes your weakness. And I think this is what happened to political correctness. This has happened to a lot of movements that people overdid it. So it became a weakness and the other side pushed back. And that's why there's never a balance because it's just swinging left and right. And often the minority groups believe that this is my turn now. And I need more. I deserve more. And this is what I felt as, as an Eastern European in the UK. I don't want to get a job because I'm Eastern European, but I don't want to be rejected for the same reason either. I want to get it because I'm the best person for that role. And I think if we can get to that level, then we have a solution. Stefan? Stefan, would you like to come? Yes, I uh, thank uh, Xaba for your comment. I think it's um, it's really a, a valuable point, and um, I think we should, you know, uh, and what is great is that uh, a lot of people now start to realize that there is, you know, there shouldn't be any um, uh, differences between men and women in in the in the work environment and in any place, and um, it's it's. Uh, with people like us, that uh, things will start to change. And uh, you know, I'm the way I've raised my daughter. Um, I'm I'm really proud of of what she, uh, I mean, what she became. And and she's only 17. And I'm I'm sure that uh, when I see what, how she handles, you know, possible comments from boys, um, you 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 can see the difference in the new generation. Yeah. So Stephen Howard, once again, the author of more than 20 books. <laughs> um, so it's all about the brain, right? The brain is wired to accept or reject or, or you know, what's, what's your take on this? Well, the, the brain is wired and, you know, our unconscious bias sit in there. But, you know, like Chaba, Chaba was saying, I mean, the psychological safety is so important, particularly in the workplace. Um, I would, I would argue that, <laughs> Women need to, well, one of the things I teach people is how to communicate assertively, but you have to define what do you mean by communicating assertively? And by that, I mean, you have to have an environment where you can express your opinions openly, honestly, freely. But the, part of that also means you have to let the other persons express their opinions openly, honestly, and freely. And 
You have to listen to them. And I think this is where we go wrong so often. I mean, it's okay to say I can speak my, my mind, but I got to listen to the other people speak my mind. I might not agree with everything Chava says, but I got to, I, I, he has to listen to me and I got to listen to him. And then we can have a dialogue. And that's what the country doesn't have at the moment, the, the U.S. country that too many of us are focusing on in the conversation here. But it's what we don't have a society right now. Is, to, is that understanding of each other by getting into a dialogue. A dialogue, one of the things I love to tell people, two monologues is not a dialogue. <laughs> and so, and that's often how we talk. We talk across purposes to each other. So, uh, so I'm just gonna, that, that's what I would say. Learn to communicate assertively, which also means you need to learn to listen assertively as well. Oh, last sorry, words. I, I sorry, I get a bit impassioned about that. I, I know it's just you know but, all the all, all the air just went out of my balloon. <laughs> well, there's Mark. Let Mark talk. Mark, Mark keeps changing his screen. Now he's got a rainbow. I love trying to get your guys' attention, man. Over yeah. here in the corner. Um, I want to say first to Sandra that I enjoyed that book by Gladwell, uh, talking to strange talking to strangers. One of the things he says in there that caught my eye and my ears was he said that most people give other people the benefit of the doubt. In other words, you think they're more in the, in, the, in the truthful stage than they are in the falsehood stage. And secondly, um, the book I just wrote, putting a little plug in there, it's called The Noble and Great Ones. And I believe that everyone on this call has nobility and greatness within them. You just have to search it out, seek it out. And I think naturally we want to be good to our fellow man and help our fellow man versus being judgmental and critical and telling them what's wrong, what's wrong with them. Because just as many things you say are wrong with them are probably issues you've got with yourself. So I think we need to just kind of relook at, look at things, refocus. That's my, that's my closing thought. So I want to say that, uh, the one sec, uh, I just want to say that Mark Colo is on the board and one of the founders of, a, uh, of our favorite charity, findneurohelp.com. Or is it no? It's dot org, isn't it, Mark? No, oh, it's it's dot org. Yes. Yeah. Find neuro, n e u r o. Find neurohelp dot org, and it's uh, about um, helping families, helping people who have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or some other uh, neuro uh, situation. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. What we do is we we look for individuals that are struggling with the illness they have. I've had Parkinson's for 14 years. I don't want to spend much time talking about Parkinson's, but each neurological disease brings a certain set of difficulties and challenges. You can see I shake a little bit. It's called a resting tremor. And it, it tends to get a little bit worse when I'm under stress. So you can probably tell I'm a little under duress here. I'm, I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. But, but we came up with uh, our service model, which is called our perimeter of hope model. And this is up on the top right. And what we do is we essentially take that individual, we help them with their mental outlook, try and get them to see that there's clear skies ahead. Let me go the way here. There's clear skies ahead. You know, the future is still bright. There's opportunity. We help them with financial planning because that's a big issue that comes up when you get diagnosed with a chronic illness. We talk about estate planning. We help them with uh, educational planning. We do medical research, fund medical research. And we... Um, we help at the end, end of a journey when you want to move to a lower cost of living, we help with relocation. So we try and wrap this perimeter of hope around the individual so that they can feel confident that they're headed in the right direction and, and, and that somebody cares. We, we, above all, we want to be an advocate. So that's kind of what, what we do and that's what we're about. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Steve, you. I, I'm sorry I interrupt. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, there's another point I wanted to refer back to when we talk about education. And, it, you know, it may not be, maybe too late for our generation, quite frankly. And for those of you who are parents, maybe it's okay for you. But those of you who are grandparents now, take the words out of your vocabulary, please. When you talk to girls, young girls, pre-teenage girls, don't ever say you're being bossy. I think that's where a lot of these misconceptions start from. I mean, boys are told they have leadership skills and little girls on the playground in our schools and our homes are said, don't be bossy. You know, well, that's not, that's just get rid of that phrase. That's my other soapbox. So if you just you teach, teach the world to sing, teach the world not to say you're bossy. Yeah, Stefan, you agree, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, great. Totally you agree, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, Sandeep, uh, thanks, uh, thank you very much. Please come back. 
Um, uh, Sandra Corona, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Lena, thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great to thank see you. you all. Thanks a lot. Chaba, Bye -bye. Ali. Bye. Good luck Bye. with your books. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure to have all you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great meeting. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day, and stay safe.